everybody. Uh, my name is David Soren. I'm the lead pastor here at Renovation Church. Uh, you know, Christians have this uncanny way of losing our focus and straying from this path that God wants us to be on. Uh, it's like in our history, we just can't seem to help ourselves from turning Christianity into something that it's not. But what's really interesting, though, is Every generation and every culture seems to be tempted to do this in a different way. For instance, this morning, I'm going to preach a message where I am convinced that my first point would get me burned at the stake in Europe in the 1400s, okay? And then when I get to my third point, if I could somehow time travel and preach this to even a typical solid Bible-believing church in America in the 1940s, I'm almost positive they would be looking for rocks to stone me and kick me out of their church. And yet, I'm almost positive that you are not going to be looking for a rock today. In fact, this message might not even cause you to bat an eye. And also yet, I'm moderately convinced that if you were to re-listen to this message in the year 2045, it might irritate you greatly. What am I saying? I'm saying that one of the things we learn uh, from church history is that the church tends to swing like a pendulum. And we just react and we overreact. And we really struggle as the capital C church to stay in the middle where the truth is. And so even if we read about a particular topic in scripture that doesn't seem like a pressing struggle to us right now, it's critical that we pay close attention to it because history tells us that if we ignore it, then soon enough, it will be a struggle for the church again. So we're gonna take a look today at some very interesting warnings from the Apostle Paul in our letter of Colossians that we are studying. So everybody grab a Bible, whether you bring your own or you use the ones here, your phone, whatever you use, there's a Bible uh, under the chairs in front of you. We're on page 805, uh, Colossians chapter 2. Uh, we are finishing Colossians chapter 2 today, which actually will conclude our Jesus Over Everything series. And the next week, we're going to take a short break from the book of Colossians for about a month or so and go into a cool series called Names of God. And so here's what we're going to do. Over the next five weeks, we're going to look at select scripture passages. We'll dive into a particular passage, and we're going to study some of the more unique and powerful and specific names of God. So I'm really excited about this. I think this is going to be really cool. And then when we get to January 1st, we're going to jump back into the book of Colossians uh, and do chapters 3 and 4 together uh, in a series called Roadmap for the Resurrected. So that's going to be really cool. So that's kind of what's coming up. So uh, we're in the Bible now. Chapter 2, so you want to find the big number 2. Uh, we left off at verse 16, and uh, that's where we are. So here's what Paul says. He says, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Okay, let's stop there. Now, the early church of Paul's day was growing up really in a confusing world because they were trying to figure out how do we as Christians integrate or not integrate in the Old Testament and Judaism into our faith. And what was happening in the first century of Christianity is there would be evangelists like Paul who would go to cities and they would tell people about Jesus. Uh, they'd, they'd help people come to Christ. They'd start the church, be around for a little while, and then they'd go to the next city. Well, in cities like Colossae, what was happening is then other Christians would come in and they'd say, yeah, you know, Paul told you about Jesus, but if you really want to be a good Christian, what you need to do is start bringing in the other practices of the Jewish faith. And you're going to need to make sure that you celebrate the Jewish religious festivals. Passover, Hanukkah, you name it. You, you're going to need to make sure that you follow Jewish dietary laws. That's why Paul in, in that first verse is talking about food and, and drink. And then they'd say, and any good Christian needs to fully honor the Sabbath, just like the Jews did in the Old Testament. But what do we see Paul say to them? This, so look at verse 16. This is the beginning. This is kind of interesting. You don't see this kind of language a lot in the New Testament. He says, don't let anyone judge you by what you do with these things. And so Paul was worried that these brand new Christians were starting to feel like, hey, if we don't do all of these things from the Old Testament, and if we don't bring in all the ritualistic aspects of the Old Testament, then are we really Christians? 
And this thing that these Colossian Christians were worried about is the first of what I'm, I made up a word for us today. It's the first of what I'm going to call a deceptive ism. And so what we're going to do, we're going to look at three isms that Paul is warning about today. And keep in mind, as I write these statements, these statements are false because they're deception. So let's take a look at the first one. What we see really in these first two verses is what I would call ritualism. And the false idea, the deception of ritualism, is we think that ritualism makes me automatically more spiritual. But Paul is saying that engaging in rituals doesn't automatically bring you closer to God. In fact, engaging in rituals could, not necessarily, could draw you even further away from God. And this is where they would start getting the fire ready to burn me in the 1400s, okay? Because that's really where the high tide of ritualism was in Christian history. And Paul is saying that, okay, all of these rituals, whether they're from the Old Testament or they're just new ones that kind of look like the Old Testament, rituals should not be your main focus. If you make them your main focus, he uses the illustration of a shadow. And he says, that's kind of like expecting a visit from a great and important person. Let's say you're there, you're getting ready, and as soon as you see that person's shadow, the sun is behind them, and you see the shadow kind of coming up from around the building, and you start to get really excited, you're like, ha! They're coming, they're here. I see their shadow, it looks looks just like them. It's anticipation, right? That's good, that's great. But let's say they come around the corner, they walk up to you, they're here. What Paul's saying is you don't wanna be like, oh, this is so great. Your shadow is amazing. Just look at it, it looks just, can I touch it? It looks just like you, right? That's not the point, right? Paul is saying that the shadow is not the focus anymore once the person In this case, Jesus has arrived. So let's take the Sabbath, for example. Uh, That's the day of rest in the Bible. For the Jews, they rested, they didn't work, they focused on God on Saturdays. Or Christians, they do it on Sundays in the early part of the church for people who were focusing on the Sabbath. But Paul is actually teaching here, and a lot of people don't know this verse even exists in the Bible. Paul is actually teaching here in Colossians that the Sabbath was a shadow that pointed to what eventually could be found in Jesus. And so now it is in Jesus that we find our rest. And thus, Christians are not bound to a specific ritual rest, either on Saturday or on Sunday, but we are to find our rest in the person of Jesus. Now, if that's making you feel a little bit nervous, let me just say this is a church that believes in talking about tension and nuance. And so let me also say again, do you remember how Paul started verse 16? He said, therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you do with these things. Well, why? Why did he say that? Isn't there like a right way? Like do it or not? It's kind of fascinating, but Paul takes a sort of mature stance of nuance, uh, even when he talks about the exact same subject in Romans. So let me show you a verse from Romans where he's also talking about the Sabbath and festivals. So Romans 14. Uh, uh, starting in verse five, he says, one person considers one day more sacred than another. So this would be the person who says, yes, the Sabbath is so important, you need to honor the Sabbath or a religious festival as a separate sacred day. But then he says, another considers every day alike. They say, "There's there's no special day, every day is alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Again, you don't see this sort of thought a lot in the New Testament. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. And he goes on to say, and vice versa. So here's what that means. He's saying, if you feel like every day is basically the same, then you need to live all 365 days to the Lord. And yet, Paul says on the opposite side, if by honoring the old traditions, right, or by having your family take a Sabbath, every Sunday, where you very specifically on that day, you don't work, you have extra focus on Jesus Christ, if that is helping you find more rest in Jesus, then by all means, Sabbath it up, my friends. (laughs) And if you can't find a better way to find rest in Jesus, just don't just say, oh, that means we don't have to do it, saying, if you're not finding a way to find rest in Jesus, then perhaps the Sabbath is a way you should do that. But the main point of each text is let's not judge each other either way, because Paul points out 
The point is not how we find rest in Jesus, but that we find rest in Jesus. And so here's a principle to help you kind of think through this tough subject on really all of these isms, but specifically ritualism. So here's what you want to do. You want to examine yourself, and you want to ask, okay, which one of these am I? And you want to be number one, just a spoiler here. Am I doing this ritual because it brings me closer to Jesus? Or am I doing this ritual because it makes me feel like a better Christian? which is what you don't want. So let me give you a super practical example. Practical example. Some of you in here are thinking about perhaps doing uh, Advent this December. Now, if you're, uh, you're new to the faith, uh, you've maybe never heard that word before, uh, Advent is a ritual that some churches have used in the past to anticipate the coming of Christmas, the coming of Jesus, and, and even Jesus' return. Now, if that's you and you're like, yeah, I'm thinking about doing some sort of rituals to celebrate Advent on the four Sundays leading up to Christmas, okay, well then ask yourself these questions. Are you doing it because it's gonna give you a really concrete way for four Sundays with your roommates or with your family to be focused on Jesus? And like a spiritual discipline, it'll allow you to four Sundays in a row to have some extra focus on Jesus. If that's why you're doing it, Oh man, you better find a way to celebrate Advent. That's amazing. Absolutely do that. However, if you check your heart and you find that the reason you really want to celebrate the ritual of Advent is because it will make you feel like a better Christian. Or the reason you want to celebrate Advent is because then you're going to be able to share about it on Instagram. And you're going to be able to say, hey everybody, we're doing the Advent thing. And look, swipe through each picture. There's each one of my kids blowing out the Advent candle. (laughs) And my kids are a little bit more spiritual than yours. Okay, now if that's in your heart, and do it for real, check your heart on this. If that's what's in your heart, that ritual is just going to make you feel above other Christians, then the teaching of Colossians 2, 16 through 17 is that the last thing you should do is Advent. Does that make sense? So he's warning about, the rituals can be amazing, but they also can be kind of deceptive because they trick us into feeling that by partaking in the ritual, God loves us more, which is not the gospel. It's not the good news of Jesus. Okay, let's move on to the second deceptivism if we can. So we're at verse 17 now. Or sorry, 18. Uh, Paul says, Don't, do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Okay, Here's what we're seeing in these verses, and I'm actually gonna spend uh, significantly less time on this second deceptivism because I think this is less of a threat to our current context, at least in what we're doing in the American church. But here's what I'll call the second deceptivism. I'm gonna call it mysticism. A mysticism just means like this high intense spiritual experience that often is kind of hard to even put words to. Mysticism for a lot of people makes them feel like I'm more knowledgeable than you because I had this intense spiritual experience. And so Paul's saying, there were people in the Colossian church that were saying, you know what you need to do? You need to worship angels like I do. You need to have this mystical experience of angels. And this group of people, he said, they were going into great detail about what the angels were like and what they had seen. And Paul says, all it's really doing is puffing up a lot of pride in their minds. And you see the Christian church struggle with this at times in history. Actually, I would say you see pockets of even uh, the charismatic church today struggle with this, where Christians get really distracted by what the supernatural might be like, rather than just studying what the Bible tells us it is like. And I think mysticism is deceptive because It feels super spiritual to start talking about, well, this angel does this, and this angel's name is this, and really what you need to study, and you just feel like, oh man, I'm so spiritual right now, and God is so in love with me based on my mystical knowledge. And again, it's it's not the gospel, right? That's not the truth of Jesus. 
Okay, let's move to the third deceptivism because here we're gonna come in contact with a deceptivism that has been a massive, if not maybe the biggest thorn in the side of the American church really over our scope of 300 years or so. So uh, verses uh, 20 through 23 now. Uh, Here's what Paul says. He says, since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules which have to do with the things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. So what Paul is talking about here is what Christians call legalism. A legalism is, is this idea that Christians should add, it's a false idea, that Christians should add a whole bunch of extra rules on top of the Bible. And then we say you all need to obey all those extra rules. And then often legalism devolves into this idea that the only way that God really loves you is if you obey all of the extra rules. And legalism is kind of like religion on steroids. And that's what some of the false teachers are also bringing to this Colossian church plan. I feel super bad for this church plan, by the way. Maybe it's just someone who works with church planners. They have a lot of problems. <laughs> but, okay, so they're telling them, okay, there's a bunch of extra rules you guys didn't know about. That's verse 21, where it's like, don't handle, don't touch, don't, 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 don't. And Paul says, you know what those are? Those are human commands. Okay, they're not from God. They're not in his word. And actually, he even points out that these new human rules are quite deceptive. That was verse 23, where he says, they have an appearance of wisdom, but they're not actually wise. And that's why legalism is our third deceptive-ism. And here's what legalism makes you think. Legalism makes you think, it's not true, but it makes you think, ah, I am the most loved by God because of all the extra rules that I try and obey. And now, my friends, we are at the part of the message where in 1940s America, they would be finding a rock to throw at my face. Because, here's what happened in Christian history. Uh, Evangelical Christianity in the early to middle part of the 20th century largely drifted into fundamentalism uh, for a while. And so, if you were to time travel, let's say to 1946, and you're walking the streets of Minneapolis, you're walking next to the tallest skyscraper at that time, it was the Fauché Tower, if you know what it is, and you're walking down the street, and you come up to somebody and say, excuse me, uh, miss, I'm not really from around these parts. Could you tell me what a Christian is? You know what they'd say in 1946? They would say, that's easy. A Christian is someone who doesn't drink, they don't smoke, They don't gamble, they don't dance, and they definitely don't go to the movies. A Christian. No, that's a legalist. Okay, now, are there bad things associated with? Can sinful things happen with each of those? Absolutely, right? But what was happening in the middle of the 20th century in most Christian churches is they got off track. And rather than searching the scriptures to see how has God himself commanded us to live and then seeking out the Holy Spirit for guidance on the places that it's not explicit on because that's how the New Testament tells us to live. Rather than doing that, they had come up with their whole own new set of rules and said this is how you need to live. And that's legalism. And listen, as foreign as that kind of may sound to you, legalism still has a death grip on much of the global church. Now let me give you an example of this. Uh, I was in Haiti a few years ago, and we were doing some street evangelism, just sharing about Jesus on the streets. And we came up to this woman, and we were sharing that despite everything she's done, that Jesus loved her, he died for her, and he could change her life. And the gospel, I mean, the Holy Spirit just moved, and the, the gospel just got a hold of this woman, and just like we see here almost every week, she just began to, just tears in her eyes, and she said, I wanna become a follower of Jesus Christ. And so we begin to do follow-up, just like we do here on a Sunday morning. And I said to her, okay, one of the first things and most important things you need to do is you need to get to a church uh, this Sunday. And she started to look so sad. And she said, I can't go to church. And I said, why? And she said, because I'm too poor. And I said, I'm, I'm really sorry, forgive me, I'm not from here, I'm not, 
I'm not sure I follow. Can you, can you help me understand? And she said, well, in this part of Haiti, you can't go to church unless you wear very fancy dress clothes because God doesn't love you unless you come with a fancy appearance to church. And I'm too poor to buy those clothes. You know what that is? That is legalism from the pit of hell, my friends. What is it? It's a church or a group of churches that have developed a moral code that is supposed to be on par with God's word, but it's not in God's word. It's legalism. Now, I think here's the challenge of verses 20 through 23 for most of us right now, right? Because that's not the culture we live in. If I can demonstrate this, I will for you on another a weekly continuum. I love continuums. Okay, let's say way over to the end of the continuum over here, let's say this represents uh, people all around the world, uh, Christians all around the world that are on the f- extreme end of legalism. Uh, kind of like I just mentioned in Haiti, they feel like they've got to check every box and do all these extra rules and then God will love them. But let's say on the other end of the continuum, we, we would plot, and you're plotting people based on where they are, we would plot Christians who are not legalists at all. In fact, these are people that they don't even take the commands that are in the Bible very seriously, and they're not taking seriously at all holiness and, and purity and how God wants to live our lives. Now, let me ask you a question. If you had to plot the average American churchgoer of 2022, somewhere on this plot, super legalistic, don't take the commands of God seriously enough, which side would you put them on? Everybody raise a hand, put a hand up in the air, and I want you to point to the legalist side or the non-legalist side. Which side do you think the American church is mostly on? Okay, looks about 95% of you are pointing over here, okay? I agree. I think for most of us, legalism is not the pressing issue of the day, but I am telling you, based on what happens in church history, it will swing back soon enough. In fact, for the, some of you that pointed this way, you may be seeing what I'm beginning to see. I'm seeing hints already of the pendulum starting to move this way. And here's why I think this is happening. I think Christians, right now in 2022 in America, are beginning to wrestle with how do I avoid being polluted by a culture out there that looks less and less Christian every single day. And here's what I think is gonna happen for a lot of Christians. I think they're gonna fear what's happening and out of that fear to try and maintain what is a Christian culture, they will accidentally impose more and more rules, extra biblical rules upon themselves. And that's why I think what we're gonna see over time is the pendulum starting to swing, which is why we study the scriptures at all time, even if we're like, ah, it's not us right now, because it's probably gonna be us in a short time. And for others of you, and this maybe just depends on your context, your upbringing, what kind of church you went to as a young person, for a lot of us, you are maybe struggling with legalism right now. And if that's where you are, what I wanna do now is I wanna share a parable with you, a classic parable, And it's going to show you what I think is the ineffectiveness of legalism. Here's how the parable goes. There once was a man who planted a garden. And this man was delighted when shoots began to emerge from his garden. And every day he would go out to his garden that he loved, and he weeded, and he tended, and he watered the garden, until he was ecstatic to see that even in the garden, his plants were starting to bear fruit. However, one day he goes out to the garden, And he's completely dismayed because every single plant showed evidence of hungry rodents who had come and raided his crop. And so he decided what he was going to do is he was going to erect a fence. So he puts a fence around his garden, right? Some of you have this struggle in real life, right? Okay. So he goes out a few days later and he checks on his garden and the rodents had come back. And so he decides what he's going to do now. He's going to go a few feet out and build another fence, this one even taller. Goes back a few days later, the rodents had come back. So he builds another fence, a few feet out, even taller than the second one. And he keeps going on, so on and so forth, but every time he comes back, the rodents had gotten back in his garden. So at this time, he decides, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to build the biggest brick wall that anybody's ever seen. 
because those rodents were going under, they were going over, and so he builds this massive brick wall. I mean, it goes underground, even there's a deep foundation. He's got a ladder going up and down. He's got everything around, and he finishes the last brick, and he declares victory over the rodents. He is so confident in his victory. I mean, this gardener, he's, he was pro- he's probably doing the gritty on the way home, right? He's feeling so good, so good about it, right? I mean, that part's not actually in the actual parable. That was a Minnesota contextual parable for you. Okay, so here's what he does. He's so confident in all of these walls he has built around his garden that for three weeks he doesn't check on his garden. He goes, I got, I got amazing, I got so many walls, it's fine. Three weeks later he goes, I better check on my garden. He goes up, he climbs the ladder up his amazing brick wall, starts climbing down, and he is horrified. The ground is choked with weeds. It's cracked, the plants have wilted, and worst of all, his crop of fruit, it's ruined. Why? Well, two things went wrong. Number one, he trusted so much in the protection of his walls that he had forgotten to tend to his garden. And number two, worst of all, he had completely overlooked really the greatest threat to his garden, and that is this, that many of the rodents had already been inside the garden all along. Now, I love this classic parable because I think it's such a good description of the New Testament's theology about our hearts, about sin, about change. Because here's how the parable works, the garden is your heart. And the rodents of sin can come from the outside world. And so yes, I would say putting up walls, and the walls are protections that you put in place in your life, so you don't allow more sin to come into your life. Walls are important, put some walls up. Honestly, my personal take is most modern American Christians could benefit by having some more walls in their life. Many of you are letting the spiritual enemy influence your minds nightly because you have no resistance to what you watch or what you listen to. Put up some walls in your life. Walls help protect your heart from letting more and more sin scurry into it. Please don't hear me say otherwise today. However, here's a biblical truth. Walls cannot change your heart. And this is, I think, the truth of scripture that so many Americans miss. Some of you need to listen really closely to this world, this word. The sinful world out there, because some of you are going, oh, the world is so messed up. I just gotta get away from the, it's so messed up. You need to know that God's word teaches that the sinful world out there is not the only threat to your heart. Do not forget that the rodents of sin are already present in the garden of your heart. And your sinful heart is a threat that you cannot escape from. It has this odd habit of following you everywhere you go. See, but legalism, the idea that we just need to build more walls, is a deceptivism because it wants you to believe that the one who builds the most walls is the one who is most loved by God. And the one who builds the most walls is the one who is holiest to God. But that actually might not be true at all. I mean, you could be trying to check all the boxes, right? All the extra rules. And you could be saying, okay, huh, I'm doing this right. I got my kids in the right a schooling situation. I, I make sure my young kids don't, don't have a phone. And I got all the filters on my own account. And I keep good company with my friends. And I don't drink and I don't smoke. And I don't. And I've built and I've built. And I've wah, 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 wah. And the apostle Paul would say to you, oh, be careful. Be careful with that. Because he says in verse 23, you know what that leads to? He says it leads to actually a self-imposed worship, a self-worship in a false humility. Here's where it leads to. You build wall, 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 and pretty soon, almost every time, you'll be looking out and you'll be saying, at the other people in this room, you'll be saying, you guys see that lady in the fifth row over there? She doesn't have a lot of walls. And what happens right here to your nose? It just keeps getting a little higher. A little higher. I got a lot of walls. I got, and the warning from God's word to you is if you let your pride of your walls get so high, the pain of your downfall will be even greater. 
Because Paul says at the end of verse 23, look at this with your eyes. This is one of the most important parts of this passage. He says all these extra walls, they, they, they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. So the walls don't actually help change your heart, right? To want sin. In other words, here's a way to explain it. The garden of your heart still has rodents crawling all over it. And unless you let the master gardener, Jesus, actually work on your heart, it doesn't matter if you've built 10,000 walls. And before I step down, let me, let me speak to a few of you in this room. Because I know in a room this size, there are some of you in this room that you grew up in homes that had 10,000 rules. You know what I'm talking about? And most of them weren't even in here. And you probably felt shamed every time that you didn't obey one of those rules. And thus you grew up in a home of rules, not in a home where there was a relationship with Jesus. And I know living in Minnesota, that there are others of you that you grew up in an incredibly ritualistic home and you did all the Christian rituals, but you never actually had a relationship with Jesus. If that's you, you grew up in a rural home or a ritual home, I would love for you to meet the real Jesus today. The one from the Bible who isn't like that. And if you don't believe me, all you can do is just investigate it yourself. If you think that's, I'm not, are you for real? I am, and so what I want you to do is that Bible that you're holding, would you even just take it with you today? And then even tonight, what I want you to do is I want you to open up to the book of Matthew. That's the very first book in the Bible about Jesus, and I want you to just read it for yourself. I want you to see who this real Jesus actually is, and you're gonna see a Jesus that you don't have to impress into your life. You don't have to impress with your religious devotion on special holidays or your dedication to obey all these extra rules. The real Jesus has seen all of your life and all of your mess ups and all of your sin and yet he still loved you so much that he came to the cross to die for you. The real Jesus has seen that you have built all these extra walls and you failed anyway. The real Jesus has seen that you did all the rituals of your church growing up, right? And you went to first communion, you did catechism, and you did confirmation, and you did all these things, and you still failed anyway. And he says, you know what? I still love you. So much so that I came to offer my life for yours, and I have died on the cross for you, for your sins and I could forgive you if you would believe that and let me lead you. See, the real Jesus is not someone that you need to impress into your life. The real Jesus is someone you need to invite into your life. And if you do, he will come in, he will lead you. Yeah, he'll show you the right path to walk on. But then when you stumble, because you will, because guess what, you're a human being. When you stumble, he is still there with you, picking you up in his grace and walking with you. And so if you need to know that real Jesus today and you're going, I want that, I wanna, I wanna do that, I wanna walk with that Jesus for the first time, after the service today, we're gonna sing one more song and then after the service today, we'll have a follow-up team up here in the front right. What I want you to do after the service is just walk up to them and they'll help you get started in that real relationship with this amazing Jesus, okay? All right, let me pray. Lord, we thank you so much uh, that you are what we see in the scriptures. Lord, help us avoid these deceptive isms that make us feel like we're better because we accomplished something. Uh, bring us back to the truth, God, that you just love us despite if we accomplish nothing, God. You just love us. Now, we're just so grateful for your grace and your love this morning, and we, just, we worship you now, and we thank you for that. In your name we pray, amen.